My name is Igor Minar. I'm a software engineer at Google in Mountain View, California. I lead the Angular project there. And I have lots of responsibilities on this project. And one of them, as a, I consider it a hobby, is running Angular I.O., which is our website. And what I thought would be interesting is to talk about search engine optimiz optimizations and um, JavaScript and client-side rendered applications. So even though I'm going to mention Angular and Angular I.O. quite a bit today, all of the information in this presentation are generally applicable to any JavaScript library or framework. Um, and I share, I'm going to share lots of information with you. So I already published the slides. And in the slides, you'll find links to code snippets and uh, specifications and other information, uh, some postmortems and other fun stuff. With that, I already mentioned Angular I.O. Angular I.O. is a progressive web application built with Angular. It's a community hub application where we share information about Angular, um, share information about events in, happening in the Angular community, but also share information about uh, Angular itself. It's uh, the main documentation site for the project. Uh, we use this project also as a way to experiment with Angular itself before we roll any kind of um, bigger improvements to Google or the external community. And one of these experiments that we tried on the Angular I.O. website is this challenge, can we build a client-side rendered uh, progressive web application and make it high traffic site and reachable by search engines? And I'm happy to say that today about 1.4 million unique visitors come to Angular.io monthly, and most of them come through search. So this is definitely possible, and I'm going to show you how. But before I go any further, let me give you a little disclaimer. Even though I work at Google, I'm not affiliated with the search team, and I don't represent them. All of the information that I'm going to share with you was um, gathered through experiments and building Angular I.O. as a developer, and also reading public information. So I'm not going to spill any beans uh, that were secret in the past. You might be wondering, why does search friendliness matter? And it really comes down to um, making your application and the information this application provides as widely uh, accessible to users around the world. There is around 4 billion people around the world that come and access the internet. And when they come online, they usually come for two reasons. They either need to get something done or they're looking for some information. And your application is often the source of this information. Users use search engines to ask queries and get relevant results, and search engines then send traffic to, to your to websites. You might be wondering, how do search engines create these results? How do they index the web? And the answer to that is both simple and complicated. And I'm actually not the expert on this, but I know an expert. John Mueller is a search uh, analyst at Google, and he gave an excellent presentation at Angular Connect two years ago where he explained how all of this stuff works. And I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in this particular topic. This year, he actually updated some of the information at Google I.O., so there's additional talk that I would also recommend if you're interested in this topic. In general, you might be thinking, OK, what should I do? Uh, how, do I, how can I be successful uh, when I build my application and want to make it accessible? The search uh, companies would generally tell you, well, just treat the crawler as a regular user. Start by providing valuable content and create great user experience. One thing I would add to that is also make your application accessible to screen readers. And the reason for this is because crawlers and screen readers often share similar constraints. So if you invest into making your application accessible to screen readers, you will actually get the double the reward uh, because you will be able to access uh, users that have the needs of using screen reader, but also search engines will understand your application better. There are five key takeaways that we learned from building Angular I.O. And these are the ones that I'm going to share with you. Number one is think URLs. Even though we are building rich applications, we should be thinking in terms of documents, especially if we are building applications that provide very valuable information. This information needs to be addressable, and the address to this document is a URL. So whenever you start working on a big project, 
that provides a lot of useful information. Sit down and think about the information hierarchy in your application and design your URL schema so that you don't need to change it later. Because any kind of changes are actually a breaking change to your public API. Your URLs are public API of your application and a contract between your application and the rest of the web. You have several ways how you can control this public API surface. The first one is links, which you should express through anchor tags, ahref. You can use links to um, help users discover content, but also express relationships between different screens on your application. One thing you should avoid is doing imperative navigation from JavaScript using onclick or other event handlers, especially if you don't have a matching anchor tags in your application. This makes the application hard to access to screen readers, but also the crawlers will not understand the graph and dependencies between screen on, screens on your application. The next tool at your disposal is robots.txt. Robots.txt allows you to create a blacklist of URLs and URL patterns that you don't want the crawler to see and index. Use this to exclude any kind of testing or staging or archival sites that you don't want to be displayed in the search results. Um, use this feature very carefully. It's very easy to uh, drop out of in, uh, the search index if you misconfigure robots.txt. And one of the common mistakes that developers make is that they block JavaScript images or other assets that are necessary for rendering uh, the document, the URL, uh, that you want to be indexed. Make sure these are not blocked. The last tool uh, at your disposal is sitemap.xml. Sitemap.xml provides guidance to crawlers as to what is the pool of interesting URLs that uh, the crawlers should be interested in. This doesn't guarantee that all these URLs will be indexed, but it's, it's a good hint and a very strong signal to the crawler. At minimum, I suggest that all of your static URLs and any static routes that are not parameterized are present in the sitemap.xml. And again, as I mentioned, URLs are your public API. Don't break it. Deprecate them through redirects. One of the things we learned is that not only server-side, but also client-side redirects are treated just fine. And the crawlers understand that um, you moved some content from one place to another. And once you, you realize and once you analyze uh, your traffic and, and find out that uh, particular URLs, URLs are no longer significant entry points to your application, that's when you can remove them. Number two is about speaking your SEO strategy. Often people think that this comes down to, should I do server-side rendering or should I not do server-side rendering? The answer is actually quite more nuanced. And it comes down to a trade-off between how much you want to invest in terms of effort, time, and money, and what is the reward you're looking for um, in terms of um, the coverage of your site and the ranking? Many developers don't do anything, and they just hope that things will be OK. Well, in my experience, hope is not a good strategy, and it's not something that I would recommend. The next thing you can do if you are resource constrained or if you have production environment limitations where you can't run certain, certain servers in production, you can rely on client-side uh, client side SEO, client-side rendering. And this is what we've proven with Angular IO. The results are very good. Um, Angular IO is highly ranked and is doing really well. But we know that there are some limitations, and I'm going to talk about them in a, bit, in a little bit. If search ranking and coverage is very important to your application, then I highly recommend that you look at server-side rendering and server-side optimizations. This will require more effort and more expertise, more maintenance. But in the long run, it might be worth it for your application if search accessibility is important to, to your case. But that's not where it ends. There are so many other things that you can do when it comes to providing information about structured data and additional metadata that can help search engines understand your website better. And depending on your use case, you, this, these are the things that you might want to investigate and, and implement in your application. Additionally, one thing that you should consider when deciding on a general strategy is your users. 
Your users use different crawlers and different search engines to access the information. And different search engines have different capabilities, even though in general they work in the same way. So in our experience, one of the things we found was that Angular I.O. that relies on client-side rendering only is represented pretty well on Google, Google and Ask. These are the two crawlers that we found that understand JavaScript pretty well. Unfortunately, there are other crawlers that don't do so well. And this is on us. You know, we picked this strategy, and we are missing out on reaching certain users um, that if we want to reach, we probably need to rethink our strategy. So this is a trade-off that you need to consider when deciding on how to approach uh, the solution. Number three is tools. There are different tools that can help you debug, de debug problems and understand what is happening. I'm going to share just three uh, with you, three that we heavily use. There are others, and uh, you might find others more useful in, in your particular situation. Google Analytics is something that probably most of you are familiar with. We use it to just understand um, our users in general terms, understand the trends, understand the traffic. Things like, are we growing, are we not growing, are our experiments working, uh, can be really well represented in uh, Google Analytics. Additionally, Google Analytics is also a very useful tool to understand where the traffic is coming from. So for example, in the case of Angular IO, I was surprised that almost 78% of our traffic comes from search. So search is a very significant source of traffic for our site. And if we care about the users, we need to make sure that we are well represented in the search results. Once you know that search is an important traffic source for you, there are other tools that help you understand um, how your site is represented in the search results. Search Console is one of them. This is a, this is a product that comes from the, the search team. Um, it has different information that you can see about your particular site. One of them is performance. How are your URLs or URLs belonging to your site represented in the search results, the impressions? And what is the click-through rate? Using a tool like this, you can see anomalies, like for example this one, where we ran an experiment that went terribly wrong, and we actually dropped out of the ranking uh, and had to course correct and get back on track. Um, this tool gives you that kind of visibility. Additionally, you might be interested in knowing how much of your site is covered um, by the search index. Um, how, is your, how is your site crawled by the crawler? Um, the coverage report gives you information about all of the URLs that are processed and successfully indexed by the crawler. In addition, you also see URLs that are problematic by the crawler um, and general summary of, of these. Once you want to debug these particular issues, there is a third tool that I find extremely helpful, and not many people know about this. Um, it's a tool called Mobile Friendly Test. Originally, the tool was built to help developers make their applications mobile friendly. As the search engines and users in general are moving towards mobile, uh, this is a tool that helps you diagnose mobile specific issues with your web application. In addition to that, however, I also find it useful to understand how the search engine sees my web application. Because the same infrastructure that is used by the crawler is also used by this tool. So you get to see how is your application rendered by the crawler. But more importantly, you also get to see the snapshot of the DOM uh, after running all the JavaScript. And this is very helpful when you're debugging particular issues. Additionally, this tool also highlights information about accessibility of any particular resources uh, that might be blocked by robots.txt or inaccessible for other reason. And the thing that I'm most excited about is that finally we get to see any kind of JavaScript errors that happened within the crawler. This is information that was previously very hard to obtain. And only with this tool, uh, this information is easily accessible and allows you to debug your application very quickly. Once you have all your tools in place, there are a few things you need to know about client-side specific uh, use cases. So how to be successful in the client-side world. Um, the search team recently published an article in which they actually disclosed how 
uh, these um, web applications are being rendered. And for the first time, they, they said, we're actually using uh, render based on Chrome version 41. Previously, we didn't know what was, what was the uh, rendering engine used. Now, this is great, because now we know what is the target that we are um, trying to make work. But unfortunately, Chrome 41 is three years old. It's a browser from 2015 that no other users out there use today. So if you are used to just all of the capabilities that Chrome have today, you'll be, you has today, you'll be surprised that some of them are not available in this browser. Specifically, uh, some of the new HTML feature additions uh, are missing. And the browser has no support for ES2015. So if you want to be compatible, you have to downlevel your code to ES5. And some of the APIs were explicitly disabled by the search team. These are APIs like WebSockets, uh, web workers, WebGL. And additionally, one thing to know about how this, the crawling is done, it's done in a very stateless way, where each URL is navigated to, uh, rendered, and then the DOM is snapshotted and indexed. And once that happens, all the results are thrown away, and new navigation is done, full navigation to the next URL. So you don't have any state preserved between the navigations. With this, if you want your application to be compatible, there are three things you should consider. First one is providing the right polyfill, because this is, after all, a legacy browser. You should feature detect, because I expect that the version will change uh, in the future. And you should conditionally load this polyfill so that your users don't pay the penalty if they're using Evergreen Browser. The way we do this on Angular.io is we actually provide the same polyfills that we built for IE uh, Browser and we conditionally load them using the no, mo no module attribute. This does both um, feature detection and conditional loading. It's a very convenient way to provide the polyfill. The next thing to, to keep in mind is how to do error handling. And we actually learned this in the hard way. Back in the December of last year, a tra uh, traffic dropped significantly. And for some time, we didn't know why this was happening or that it was happening at all because the site kept on working, all the tests were passing, and only uh, through user reports we learned that they no longer can find Angular.io in the search results. We investigated this and actually included an issue, um, issue link in, in this slide that you can review later with the whole investigation and postmortem and also the eventual fix. But what it came down to is, if you are relying on the client-side rendering, your server, your static server, is actually sending an empty document uh, that only contains strip ta script tags, um, and it's serving this document with HTTP 200. Uh, it's only the script, once they run, that they add content to this document, and this is the content that you want the crawler to see. If, however, there is an exception thrown as the application is being loaded and bootstrapped, nothing will be added to the document, and all that the crawler will see is an empty document and a JavaScript error. JavaScript errors are so common on the web that the crawler doesn't consider them as a significant signal, and it will rely on the HTTP 200 as a signal that everything went well. This happened to us, and even though we, we remained in the, in the index and we had a full coverage of a site, all of the URLs were empty, and the ranking algorithm thought that we were just playing some jokes or something and dropped us uh, out of the the page results. So this is why no traffic was coming. Once we knew this, um, it was very easy to fix it. We fixed the original issue that was throwing the exception. But we also learned that HTTP status codes is not something that is available to us in the JavaScript world. And JavaScript errors are not considered as strongly as HTTP status codes, and it's not something that we can use as a signal to the crawler. Um, we actually found a different way to deal with this. And the way we use uh, is using meta tags. So what we do is when the application is bootstrapping, we actually execute a very small snippet of code that adds meta tag with robots no index uh, to a document. This is the first script that runs and tells the crawler, hey, this page is not ready to be um, indexed yet. After the application is fully bootstrapped, we remove this meta tag and then the crawler sees the document the way we want it to see. If any error, ha error happens in between the 
uh, the time when the tag is added and when the page is done rendering. Um, the meta tag remains uh, in the document, and the crawler will then see you know, this document, there's something wrong with it, and it will probably issue warnings uh, and tell you, hey, there's something going on, you should go check it out. This works really well for us. Additionally, you should also think about how to handle 404s. Again, you don't have status codes available to you on the client side, and the crawler will see broken links. So it's just a matter of how do you deal with this. You can use the same noindex uh, trick to add a meta information to the documents and to communicate the, to the crawler that this is not something that should be indexed. And if you don't do this, you might see something called soft 404s. For initially, we didn't understand what soft 404s were, but soft 404s are warnings that the crawler will issue when it comes across, across a page that looks like a 404 page, but didn't give you, um, it wasn't served with a 404 status code, or didn't have the, the no index meta tag present on it. And if you don't want to be like us, avoid one of the mistakes uh, that we made where we turned our 404 page into a honeypot for crawlers. And the result of that was that at some point, almost 1,600 results were present in the search results and were pointing to a 404 page with bogus content. Once we investigated this, and again, there is an issue that describes you know, how we came uh, to realize what was wrong and how we fixed it. Um, it was very easy to fix. We just added the no index meta tag and we removed it. And the reason why these results were being displayed and often were considered highly ranking results was because a 404 page contained lots of keywords and lots of uh, links that were very interesting to the ranking algorithm, and that's why it gave it a signal boost. But once you mark it with no index meta tag, uh, this problem goes away. The last thing I want to talk about is you put all this effort into making your application um, accessible, and you are doing really well in the search results. How do you make sure that you can sustain this success? I recommend doing three things, uh, monitoring, login, and alerting. With monitoring, you are able to keep track of any kind of trends and anything happening on the site. We review the search results, uh, and we review the Search Console and the Google Analytics uh, dashboards quite regularly. We use this information to also experiment, and we use the results to analyze the experiments and then use the data out of these experiments to fuel future improvements. Logging is another way how you can get more insights into what is happening in the client side. Unlike with server-side hosted applications where you have logs that are easily accessible and you can, you have, there's lots of tools uh, to process these logs, on the client side, um, the story is slightly different. You actually need to do extra work to collect the logs. And it's definitely worth it, especially when errors are happening in production. You want to collect these errors and analyze them. There are different ways to do it, different tools. One of the, if, if you don't want to pay for a paid product, one easy way to do this is by setting up a global error handler that will send any kind of errors to Google Analytics. And this is what we've done. And I left a link to our implementation. Once you do that, you can go to Google Analytics and see general trends about any kind of errors happening in your client side, and also general summary about how frequent different errors are. And this is super useful when you're debugging. Um, Google Analytics, by default, tracks user agent. Um, if you're not using Google Analytics, please collect user agent, because that's information that is often crucial to understanding how to reproduce particular error. And the last one is alerting. If you uh, set up the Search Console for a property, Search Console will automatically send you errors about things that don't look right, that the crawler sees as it processes your site. I mentioned soft 404s, but there are other warnings that you might get. For example, your certificate is about to, SSL certifi certificate is about to expire soon. Um, that was a very useful warning for us in the past. Additionally to this, I also um, use a custom alert in Google Analytics that if you can set up in a way where uh, an email is sent to you every time there is a significant change in um, 
the traffic pattern coming from search engines. You can use this particular formula uh, on this screenshot to set it up, and you will be informed every time there is an anomaly happening in production. Super useful. So I covered a lot of ground. Uh, let me just quickly summarize. If you're building your application and relying both on server side or client side, you should think about URLs and how important they are. They are your public API surface. Don't break them, embrace them. Uh, this is something special that is specific to the web platform and sets web applications apart from native applications. So we should take a good care of, uh, of this public API surface. The second one is pick on your general SEO strategy, depending on how much you can invest or um, what are the rewards or what are the interests and what are the specifics of your application, what is the audience that you're trying to reach. There are several options. Pick the right one for you. Um, the next one is there are different tools that are available to you. Analytics, Search Console, and mobile-friendly tests are just three. There are others that you might find useful. Get familiar with them. Uh, they can really help you save a lot of time. Number four is if you do go with client side, be aware uh, that the crawler is not the evergreen browser that you typically deal with and run tests against. So make sure you load your polyfill um, and handle errors and 404s uh, properly. And the last one is if you want to be successful in the long run, set up monitoring, um, logging, and alerting so that you know about any changes happening in production and can respond to them accordingly. I want to give credit to a few people that helped me collect all of this information. Pete, George, and Martin are from the Angular team, and they helped me work through many of these issues and resolve them. And John Mueller from the search team that, through his public work, was able to share a lot of the information about how the crawler works, uh, and it's a really good resource. With that, thank you very much. The slides are already public. Uh, you, can, you can learn more about uh, different things from the links I shared. And I'm going to be doing uh, Ask Me Anything session where I'm happy to answer any questions at 2.30 on the stage. Thank you very much.